Be humble, be hard, and always push the fight. My name is Don Tran. I served in the Marine Corps for 12 years active duty, a year in the reserves, um, and I got out as a staff sergeant. Awesome. What, what years did you serve? I served in 2006 till um, 2018 active duty, then I served all of 2018 in reserves. Yeah. And what job did you sign up to do? Uh, I signed up as an O3 option, and uh, uh, when I got um, to SOI and we had a selection portion of it, like the instructors picked me to be a 0341. Mortarman. A Mortarman. Nice. Yeah. I was born and raised in uh, Long Beach, uh, California, to uh, two immigrated parents. Both my parents came over um, from Vietnam in 1975 after the Vietnam War. Um, and then, um, yeah, we was born and raised in uh, North Long Beach and lived in a, you know, a house with like three other families growing up. And then we moved when I was in first grade over to um, uh, another part of Northern Long Beach and attended uh, some public schools in the beginning, got some issues at public school, and then my parents transferred me over to uh, like a private school from first grade to eighth grade. So going from that private school uh, situation, you know, it was like a 30 class or a 30 student class from first grade to eighth grade. You know, we had some people jump in and out. So it was like a very tight knit Catholic kind of community with, um, you know, um, Caucasians, um, some Vietnamese people and Filipino people, and then um, some Hispanic people as well. So that was like our environment in that group. And then when I went to high school, I went to a public school at Long Beach Wilson. Um, and that was like a complete eye opener for me. That school had 4,000 students, you know, it had um, a shit ton of other, you know, races and everything to, for me to deal with. And it was like a kind of a culture shock going into that and super intimidating yeah. going into that. So, you know, that first year I was just like by myself. I didn't really know anybody because all my other friends went to other private, you know, schools and stuff like that. My parents didn't have money for that. So we went into, um, the public school system and I was kind of on my own trying to find new friends and like okay who can I align with you know who am I looking forward to be friends with and I was like kind of at first it was just people in class and I did decently well in um, my uh, middle school program so I had some advanced math class so I was kind of sticking with a nerdy kind of group in the beginning for my, like my freshman year so I did pretty well but after that you know I saw like you know started going through puberty like oh who are the guys that are getting the girls, you know, so I kind of navigate to that. So I started hanging out with, you know, more gangsters and, you know, guys that had uh, more negative impact on my life and maybe not negative impact in like the way of like guiding me because they were trying to help out and, and still grow up. And so I started hanging out with some older guys that got into a lot of trouble um, and kind of went down that path for the rest of my high school time. Different gangs, I never was a part of any gangs, but we hung out with, you know, um, some Tongan guys that were in like North Long Beach and there's a huge population over there. And those, those guys up there got some like Chinese mafia guys up in LA, you know, and you know, some local gangs in Long Beach, like Cambodian gangs. So it was like a very weird mix. Uh, and then Orange County as well, cause you know, I'm Vietnamese. So I always went back there with my family, met some Vietnamese gangsters. So it was just like, everybody was, trying to be the cool guy to be in a group and belong somewhere. And I'm just like, I don't know where I belong. I'm just trying to hang out with all these guys and pick up some chicks, do fun things. And that kind of led down the wrong path of getting in a lot of trouble. So like with my Vietnamese kind of crew and some of the Long Beach guys too, we were um, started stealing a bunch of clothes like and shoplifting. And then we started a business, a Facebook page uh, or my, MySpace page back in the day. And we were like selling clothes for whatever we stole it for the price tag. We would just sell it for 50% off, you know? So that mm -hmm. kind of became a trend down the line. We used to go to the racetracks and fill up my little Honda Civic hatchback in the back and just fold all the clothes nicely and have like a little shop in the back of, you know, my car and selling clothes and stuff like that. So, um, got caught a few times, um, one of the biggest ones was in the Lakewood Mall. It's in near Long Beach, but I got arrested by the county sheriffs because there's no Lakewood Police Department, which is right next to Long Beach. And that one, they were like really hammering it down. They charged me with um, burglary or grand theft or something because I just ran out of Macy's with like a you know a big <laughs> pile of clothes. I just like Lacoste shirts back in the day, I think that was a thing, and like some seven jeans and stuff, and we just had a big pile, and we were just like, we can get away. And I remember like jumping down 
like running through bushes, dropping all the clothes. I had one shirt left on me. I'm like, I'm not losing this last shirt because we had the mall security chase us. And I was running down like in the little gutters and stuff like that and just hiding in the bushes for like two hours. And the cops ended up, like there was a dog barking in the corner. So I'm like low crawling, trying to get out of the situation, but they ended up catching me and um, charging me with all kinds of things. So that was like, I went to my first juvie experience after that. Wow, they that. put you in juvie? Yeah. For how long? For 30 days. The last time I got arrested, or maybe one of the last times, I was in Ontario Mills and I was stealing some you know, DVDs and CDs from the Virgin store there. And um, this mall cop catches me and all that stuff. And then they call the cops and they're like, hey, you get one chance, you can call your mom or whatever. She comes pick you up, you know, we'll just give you a ticket or whatever that is. But I call my mom and she was just so fed up with me getting in trouble all the time. Um, she was like, I'm not coming to pick you up, hangs up the phone. I'm like, damn. <laughs> so I'm like, what do I do? You know, like I have a, my, my car was full of stolen clothes. I was like freaking out in the situation. And, uh, I remember going into like the recruiter's office probably like a few months before that I had his business card in my wallet, you know, and I was like, can I make one more call? And I ended up calling my recruiter at the time, Sergeant Powell. And he came and picked me up out of jail or out of, you know, the holding cell or whatever um, at the police station. Wow. Yeah. And for me, I was like, man, I'm trying to get away and go do something different. You know, I'm still getting caught up and all that stuff. But I decided like that was my, my vision of brotherhood. He was like, dude, this guy came out. He didn't have to. Came, picked me up, got me out of jail. You know, like um, I was worried about a piss test back then as mm -hmm. well. And so he was like helping me. He took me to like some piss test facilities to make sure that I was gonna pass before I go to MEPS and all that stuff. And so I was like, man, this is like the brotherhood. But now looking back now, he's probably just trying to hit a quota, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, they, um, were, they were hard about getting those quotas. They were huh? hard about getting those quotas, especially in that time too. And like the war was kicking off and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, anyways, I still thank him to this. If I saw him, I, I would still thank him to this day. What made you choose to, so. the um, Marine Corps? Yeah, I mean, you know, like all the recruit stations in Orange County and Long Beach and stuff like that had all the offices in one, mm -hmm. right? So you got to see all the branches and stuff like that. And I just kind of saw like the, the way the Marines carry themselves. And, you know, I saw the commercial of the guy dragging a, slaying a dragon, you know, like yeah. I knew that wasn't actually slaying a dragon, but it was like a metaphor of like how he was going to take down all his demons and, and all that stuff. And I saw like the professionalism of the Marines, and I kind of was like lean towards that a little bit more hmm. from that, yeah. Senior year, I actually dropped out of high school, and I'm like, because I was getting in so much trouble, and I was like, is there a way I can go expedite this to the Marines? And my recruiter at the time was like, yeah, you can get your GED or something. So I was like, all right, I'll stay home. Started studying for my GED, but um, through some convincing and stuff, I actually went back to high school and finished my last semester or whatever that is. But a month later, I, I was on the bus to boot camp, you know, from, LA maps down to MCRD. So that was like a culture shock. And I was just trying to get away from that experience, like I was saying before. Um, but when I got down there, I'm like, man, like, I was not ready for that. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a very intimidating place. I was coming from like a, you know, doing things whatever I wanted to do pretty much in my high school years and getting in trouble and stuff like to go into a very structured place where it's intimidating, people are yelling at you. Um, and uh, I was a really skinny kid growing up too, so I was on double rats. Ooh. So you got double the food. I think I went into boot camp, maybe like 120 pounds or wow. something like that. You know, super because I did track, um, soccer in high school, and then I played badminton as well. Um, but so super skinny kid. None of those built muscles. You know, it's just more of like endurance and, mm -hmm. and speed and stuff like that. So so I had a like a semi high school sweetheart um, going into. It. I met her like you know, the senior year and we started dating and I was going into boot camp and all that. And, um, I went to boot camp in July and we graduated in October or something, three months. Right. And my birthday, my 18th birthday was September 19th. And, um, she, I remember her sending me this really, really big birthday card and a box full of candy. So like when it, that box came in, they're like, you know, try and get the fuck up here. And I'm like, oh shit, what's going on? I thought I'm getting in trouble or something. And he just opens the card, rips the envelope off and he opens it up and he hands it to me. I'm like, I have no idea who sent me this or anything. He was like, read it. And I'm like, holy shit. So I had to read the entire birthday card out loud to the whole platoon and then the whole box of candy 
right there, they made me eat it all in like, or try to attempt to eat it all in one sitting. <laughs> Dude, threw it all of it up. It, like the Smarties were the worst because they got so dry in my mouth when I was like trying to bite them. Like that's what like triggered me to, to throw up all over the place, too. Yeah. Wow. Um, so after boot camp, you go to, was it School of Infantry at this time? Yeah. So we went to uh, SOI and that's in Camp Pendleton. Um, and then everybody does like that month and a half, I think, or whatever it is of like regular infantry training. And then mm -hmm. you get to a decision point like, hey, are you a you know machine gunner contract or whatever? I'm like, oh, I'm an open contract. And um, I had a few instructors there from SOI. They're like, oh, he's, he's Asian. He's going to be good at math. Let's make him be a mortarman. <laughs> Right, because you got to do the plotting boards and all that stuff. So that's how I became a, a mortarman going into it. Yeah, how did you feel about that? I mean, I had no idea what it was. You know, like I had no idea what anything was in the military at that point. Up in, everything I was learning like day to day, and I didn't know what like, hey, what a tube stroker was, or like, hey, we're dropping rounds to go into, you know, shoot over deflate or whatever. I had no idea what it was. I'm like, oh, shoot, we got to shoot some rockets or missiles or something. I'm like, yeah, that sounds cool to me. Yeah. You know, so... Was, uh, was the School of Infantry a change of pace from boot camp for you? I would say when you went to the mortar portion, 100%, right? It was like, because number one, you got to like learn how to set the guns up, right? And then you got to do a little bit of the math, and then you got to do all the direct lay. So that portion of it was so chill compared to the rest of them. And I can sometimes, I still see like in the morning, we're going out to do the mortar pits and the rest of the 11s and the riflemen and machine gunners are like running around with their machine guns and stuff. I'm like, dude, I think I picked the right job. You know, <laughs> like, hey, this is going to be a little bit more chill than the rest of the guys. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, what unit did you get dropped to and what was it like being dropped to a infantry unit as a brand new Marine? Yeah. So I think we graduated SOI like December 21st or something like that. Um, they gave us the weekend um, and then we had to check into, no, I'm sorry, like maybe the beginning of December or middle, middle of December or something like that. I remember checking into my unit at what 1st Battalion, 4th Marines at Camp Horno, which is literally like a mile and a half down the road from SOI. And uh, they were all, the unit was already in the field, like the last field op before Christmas break or whatever. And I get, you know, drove, driven out to the, um, uh, to the field op and the battalion commander is briefing the battalion, like, boys, we're going to fucking Iraq. And like, that was the first day of me checking in the fleet, dude. I'm like, holy shit, dude, what the fuck's going on? Like, I, like, I honestly didn't even know how much crazy the war was or anything about that. You know, I was just such in my own little world over here that I didn't really realize um, what the war was. So I, one day I heard that, dude, I was like, holy shit, I'm gonna die. You know, I was extremely scared. And then I go into like this seven day field op, no gear. I'm just like there watching everybody, you know, like they didn't give me any warming layers. It's December in Camp Pendleton, which gets pretty cold. I just had like other civilian clothes I was wearing underneath so that I could hide. It wasn't in, in uniform, you know, cause like if you're out of uniform in the military, like you're, you're fucked. Mm -hmm. So um, we got back from that, went on Christmas leave and then did like a th quick three month workup and then we were out the door and we we're on our way to um, Al Qaim, Iraq. Wow, that fast. Yeah, it was fast. And I came a little bit later, I think I was replacing somebody, but those three months of training, dude, were shitty as fuck. We were living in a squad bay, like with 20 dudes, like senior Marines, junior Marines, and all of my seniors were either from, coming just from the Najaf battle. I don't know if you ever heard of that in like the cemetery fight where it was like seven days straight of fighting no resupply of water, no barely, or barely any resupply of water and food and stuff like that. So those guys are like super seasoned guys. So like, you know, as a new guy coming in at 130 pounds at the time, maybe like, you know, they're teaching you to wake everybody up like, Hey, fire watch, you only wake him up by tapping his feet and you make sure you stand at, you know, some distance, one arm's distance away from him in case he wakes up and stabs you or whatever. I'm like, what the fuck I, wow. did I sign up for? You know, like major PTSD is like, Almost every night, these guys would get blacked out drunk, and we were living in a squad bay, and they had airsoft guns. So as the new guys, you know, they would, you know, they would fucking pick on you, you know, and do all kinds of stuff, just hammered, and we're like, dude, I started sleeping in my car, you know, just to get away from that, dude. Really? Yeah. And that, dude, I even started driving home back to Long Beach, and like crashing at home, and then leaving Long Beach at four in the morning, and then going back to to work. You know, wow. it was like. 
horrible experience in that aspect. Yeah, so we went to um, this place called uh, Al Qaim. Um, it's like right near the Syrian border in Al, Al Anbar province. And um, we were went to this post called Da Nang, um, which is kind of ironic because I'm Vietnamese and, you know, um, but um, middle, of, middle of nowhere. And everywhere that we walked and stepped to like this probably foot layer of moon dust is what we call it. So it wasn't hard enough to stay on top of it. You would step right through. So like that dust would kick up because it's so fine and you go get everywhere you possibly could have gone. And our mission at that time was to uh, make sure that the Afghan police or whatever had some type of presence and interacted with them and was like a middle post in between, you know, two different Iraqi police. And we had LAR like all the way in the corner, um, a different part of the AO. Uh, along the Syrian border, right? And majority of it was like nothing but driving over IEDs, um, maybe some machine gun fire and we would run, they would run off. So like the whole, most of the deployment, it was like very reactive. Actually, most of the infantry time I had was being reactive to the mission, getting blown up. Okay, cool. Where did these guys come from? Like, hey, what's going on? Where are we getting shot at from? Okay, like it was like an experience for me not to learn much on deployment besides like, all right, we gotta clean the trucks, we gotta clean the guns, you know, we gotta hold security here, this is our direction of fire, this is how we stand post, like all the basic stuff, so being an infantry guy, I guess, in the Iraq or the global war on terrorism kind of thing. So it was a good experience for that. Um, but overall, it was just a, it got to like 142 degrees, that was like the hottest day out there. Oof. Whenever we went down to the Euphrates River, oh my God, there's like the bugs were insane. Like you can grab like, go like this and grab your hand and like have like 20 dead gnats in your oh. hand. Like you would inhale them. So patrol sucked, mission sucked, um, heat sucked. Um, the very first day, first patrol, boom, drive over like a probably 25 pound IED, you know, and not big enough to blow off the tire, a little bit of the engine chunk, but not enough to extremely hurt anybody. So that was like my first uh, concussion, boom. You know, I was in the back right seat. So, um, and then, I think we hit like 20 IEDs that one, that wow. deployment. Some of them were big enough to fuck people up, some of them weren't, but I think it was October timeframe-ish and we were supposed to go home in November because uh, we got extended for like a month or two at the time. And um, we were tasked to push out really, really close to the border. It's like way out of our AO um, to follow this guy named Jalad Blad or something. I can't remember his name, but this guy, famous IED in placer, uh, at the time in our AO, red dirt bike, um, and uh, we were supposed to follow this guy. We had some ISR platforms on um, and stuff like that, but they followed them all the way out there. So it was like our job, okay, let's go search all these Bedouin camps or whatever it is from there, the way all the way over there, which is like a seven day op kind of thing. Um, went out there and uh, we used to lead the patrols with seven ton trucks in front because the Humvees would get fucked up from all the IEDs, so that could take a bigger blast. But I remember going into, I was the second truck behind in a regular Humvee as a gunner, and the first truck was a seven ton. They drove and hit an IED um, and launched the gunner out and uh, messed up the VC or the vehicle commander. His buttstock or his rifle was here and it like hit up as the explosion and like split his face open. So, and then the driver, my friend Jeremy Burris, um, was uh, in the seventh. He was fine though, so he helped with the medevac, got everybody out. Um, we landed the helicopter on our side of that wadi, right, because of the dry riverbed, um, and got him out of there. But when Burris walked back down to grab his glasses that were in the truck, when he jumped out of the truck, he stepped on a secondary ID. Mm. So yeah, um, instantly, you know, dead. Both his legs, his body was like probably a couple. I don't know, 60 meters away from the blast site. And then from there, it was like all hell broke loose. And that was my first real interaction with like fear. And I mean, I was always fearful in other situations as well. And, but that was like the biggest impactful moment for me. I was like 18 years old at the time, or maybe I just turned 19 um, on that deployment. And it was like super impactful. Like, holy shit, dude, you could have died. And that was like the first time I was like, felt so helpless because I was in the gunner right behind him, right? And I'm like, go in there. We got to go get him. We got to go get him. But like, they're like, you got to stand security. We started getting small arms and, you know, all these things coming in. I'm like, dude, that was like the worst situation mm. I could possibly be in at the time.
Wow. Yeah. I remember, so like we would get airdropped a lot of uh, supplies because there's so many IEDs on the road, nobody wanted to drive in and we had to pick up all this shit in the moon dust and all that stuff and they dropped off a shit ton of frozen meat but never any wood pallet or anything or any wood to cook it besides the pallet it was on. So I just remember us cooking all of our food and meat on top of the wood pallets and it was us cooking, right? Sometimes we threw eggs on the rocks because it was so hot or the meat on the rocks. But one time we were cooking before we went on patrol and um, we were cooking chicken and nobody cooked the chicken well enough that it was actually cooked in the time. So I remember eating a bunch of chicken before and I was in the gunner seat and we we're on this like three day patrol or whatever it is. And um, I had to use the restroom, I had to take a shit. And I, in the back, of, we were wear, all wearing flight suits at the time. I'm not sure what the, oh, cause the flame retardant principle is on the flight suits. Right, and all the guys were putting Velcro in the back side because you have to take off your kit, all that stuff to use the restroom. And I just remember having to like drive on patrol, and they were like, "I gotta, I gotta go to the restroom." They're like, "We're not stopping," and just reach over to the side of the turret, you know, pull that Velcro apart and just let it go. You know, <laughs> it was so bad, dude, <laughs> so bad. And they thought I was joking the entire time, and like, yeah. And then, but like, luckily the moon dust got on most of it as we were driving and cruising, you know, yeah. but getting moon dust inside your <laughs> leg and ass. And hey, man, you, you got to go, you got to go. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> man. When I came back, stayed with Weapons Company. Then we're like, oh, man, we're going back to Iraq. So we were going to Fallujah, the next deployment. Um, and um, we split more into like a traditional weapons kind of company kind of thing. So I was with the mortar platoon. Um, I went to like infantry mortar leaders course and all that stuff. And then I was like the FDC chief, which is like the fire direction control center. So I was doing all the mortarman stuff. And as soon as we get back to Iraq, our company was on the outskirts of Iraq at the time. Um, Bravo company, which is a line company with one four, I think they were taking some casualties in the city. So they asked for a squad to come replace them that had a mortar capability just in case we did that. So I took my entire um, section of uh, 81's guys and we went over there and um, supplemented with some machine gunners and then we went into the city and we just stayed there the rest of the deployment. So we attached to Bravo Company, 1st Platoon I think, and we stayed there, ran like coin operations, a lot of um, security for um, uh, uh, like local meetings and stuff like that. I'm trying to think of the word in Iraqi. Yeah, I know there's like Shura in Afghan, but anyways, but did a lot of those meetings and stuff like that. Helped the police force out there. Um, and then also like did some cordon forces for like the SEALs going to do hits in the cities or um, that was like my first experience with like special operations and seeing those guys do that. So um, yeah. And then the biggest events that happened on that deployment was I remember it's almost simultaneous, probably within like two minutes of each other, but two Iraqi police stations getting leveled, like two SVBIDs drove in there, completely leveled it. So like dealing with that mass cast was like, I think like 80 people they brought to us or more of like straight fucked up, like legs blown off, arms blown off, like, you know, all that kind of stuff. So dealing with that kind of chaos was crazy on that deployment. Uh, I remember across the street, we had a KFC. Um, really? Yeah, not the traditional KFC, it was like other chicken. We actually bought some chickens from there before, but I was on guard tower or post that day and someone literally throws like a hand grenade in there and like seeing that across the street, I'm like, holy shit, bro, like this is real. Cause it can go from super permissive to like super like kinetic and like in seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it was always like taught like the three block war. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Like one street, you're down there kissing babies and um, meeting with the locals, the next street over, it's like, hey, there's some type of threat, and the, the next street over, it's like a full-out firefight, which was like a realistic thing in Fallujah. Wow. Even though we were there in 2008, I think. So that's, of course, way after Phantom Fury 1 and 2 and stuff like that. So we were on the back end of that, like trying to rebuild the relationships and help the local government and stuff like that. So, mm. Oh, the good ones, the SEALs, because I always like to kind of give them a hard time. But we were a cordon force. I was in, like as infantry platoon, and we were just holding a cordon force, so like the outer cordon, so making sure nobody comes in. And they conduct. We're doing a, conducting a hit on 
um, this building was a HVI or something. I wasn't really privy to who it was or anything like that, but they had, they sent in these dogs to the house and the dog went in there and literally bit off a calf of like this lady that was living in the house. Turns out it was the wrong house. And uh, they went to the next one, they got the target or whatever it was, but um, literally after the hit, they're like, they bandaged her up and like they just left her with us to deal with the situation. They jumped back on their cool trucks and their tennis shoes and you know all that stuff and just rolled out with the target. And we're like, holy shit, now we gotta deal with this. So we had to stay there on the cordon for the rest of the morning you know, get medical support when the everything woke up and like kind of deal with that. So it was just like showing like these guys are assholes and they just bounced <laughs> on us. But, these were seals. Yeah, they were seals. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so th by that time, I was like, all right, it's time to uh, re-enlist or what I want to do. I think I had like maybe eight months left on my contract at the time. So I was like, all right, cool. So I saw the seal stuff happen. Saw how cool those guys were. So I'm like, man, I want to do something more. I think I'm, I'm, you know. I'm equipped to, to, to do something more. So I tried out for the state platoon, which is the surveillance target acquisition team or sniper platoon. And then I got into the platoon and I was on there for like four to five months as a pig, right? And, you know, in sniper platoon, a hog, hunter of gunmen, pig, professionally instructed gunmen. But as a pig, you're like, got to carry a pig egg everywhere. You got to run everywhere in that situation. So I really thought it was my time that I earned to go to sniper school because you, all you want to do on a sniper platoon is get go to the chance to go to sniper school and pass and you come back you know with the hog's tooth with you know being the cool guy on the platoon um, but i never got a chance to go um to to sniper school because i think this we we're doing the workup and they got some new guys that checked into battalion or into the platoon probably from security forces i think <laughs> or something i can't remember where they were from but it was three sergeants so they they end up taking my school seat. I was a corporal at the time. They ended up taking my school seat, so I never got a chance to go to sniper school. So I was mm. like super pissed, and we were about to go on the 31st Mew um, at the time, and um, I was like, man, do I even want to go on the Mew, even though I'm a sniper? So then I remember at Horn Camp Horno across the street next to the SMP, there was like a trailer, and it says uh, Marine Special Operations uh, Command or whatever, assessment, trailer or whatever that it was and I'm like cool I saw these guys walking out once in a while you know there's a subway right across the street from it and these guys are in different camis they got velcro on their thing they you know a little bit different color you know they got cooler boots on I'm like who are these guys so I went in there and I ended up asking them like what it was the um and I was like dude this is something I want to try and go for so I end up putting in my package and getting approved um but it was such a heartache because we were about to go on deployment coming up soon. And I'm like, dude, I've been on this platoon for a little bit. Um, and they ended up kicking me back to uh, my mortal platoon because they found out like I was trying to go here. So I was like, I got one chance, dude. I got to make this no matter yeah. what. And luckily, my, one of my old XOs from uh, my first deployment to Iraq was now at the regimental uh, S3 shop. So he was like, sign off on all my paperwork because I'm, technically I'm still under them right in the regiment, he signed off on all my paperwork and then boom, I was lucky enough chance to go and uh, go to selection. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So I got to selection, got selected, uh, met my business partner, Prime there um, right now, but got selected and then when I came back, or at selection, they were like, well, do you want to go on the 31st Mew or do you want to sign up for the next available ITC class? And the next ITC class was, we went in selection in 2010 in, in March and the next class was in October time frame. So there was like some time frame in between. Um, so like, hey, what do you want to do? I'm like, you can work for the regiment um, with Captain Van Horn um, at the time. And so I did. So I went, checked in there and then Prime, my business partner was already working at the Horno Pool. He was like, hey, do you want to come work at the Horno Pool with me? And then boom, got to work at the Horno Pool, you know, went to McQuist and did all that water survival stuff and trained a bunch of Marines and sailors and stuff like that. So that really helped me kind of prepare for um, um, you know, special operations and all the aquatics and trainings in the water wow. in that portion there. Yeah. So what was selection like? Yeah. I, and I still tell this to every day. Like people ask me like, what was, it's probably one of the most professional courses, courses I've ever been to, um, in the military, just like the thought process of it. There's no yelling at our selection. Maybe I don't know if that's supposed to be said or not, but there's no yelling at that, our selection or it, there wasn't when I went. 
Um, it was like, tick your directions from the whiteboard and, you know, things that you have to do that day. Of course, you got to be on time. Of course, you got to hit all your objectives for that day and all that stuff. But it was a great experience, man. It was like very, very independent, right? And mm. when you get there, there's no name, no rank. You're just a number. So there's like, when I went, when I went through, there was a bunch of guys that were force recon guys already and all that stuff that just needed the MOS to switch from 0321 to 0372. So there was like a bunch of those guys, a lot of senior guys, gunnies to majors. And it was like a very mixed kind of class, right? Versus what it is now is like, hey, um, you know, senior lieutenants and maybe corporals or young sergeants going through right now, right? So um, yeah, it was a great experience, man. And um, had some scares throughout it because I, I remember like spraining my ankle on some of the land nav stuff. But overall, it was like a great experience and um, challenging, very yeah. challenging. What was the most challenging part for you? So one of the, the team events is holding two five gallon jugs. I think it was like a three mile trek or something like that. Uh, and then of course you have your buck on and everything. And dude, my, my grip strength was not there. I, th I might've been like 140 at the time. You know, you so gained for 20 like pounds. A, yeah. So I couldn't even carry it. Like after like a mile in, I couldn't even pick up those jugs anymore. And like, I thought I was going to get dropped and failed for that one of that portions. But Prime was actually the guy that helped me out with some of the jugs. So that's why we became good friends. But um, the grip saying is a real thing, dude. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So after selection, the most professional course I've ever been to in the military, we get to ITC, right? And I think we were the third or maybe the fourth or, I don't know, very in the beginning stages of the course. And we check in, dude, and it's a complete opposite of ANS or selection. Like nothing but like yelling at you all day long, thrashing you. It was like a, I was like, what the fuck is going on, dude? Um, and come to like as we were continuing on and, and finding out more, like a lot of our instructors were not even 0372s. You know, they were coming from sniper platoons. They were coming from recon at the time. So none of these guys that even went through. ITC what we went through yet because it was so new right so mm. there was like a lot of bureaucracy of like guys that they thought they that should have let it and like weird gunners that were getting involved and just trying to get a piece of the pie so those growing pains were so real throughout the process man I, like the thrash sessions were 100% real I remember like one day we were in these trailers in Stone Bay and like some guy fell asleep in class literally in the middle of February and got everybody up out of class, have them swim, swim across the new river and then come back and sit in class and the instructors acted like nothing happened. Everyone's freezing their ass up, like just shivering. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? This cannot be like the rest of the six months. But every phase has its benefits and whatever that is. So the more you got through, like the better it off it was, mm. right? Um, and I remember our, uh, our like kind of hell week kind of situation. It, it was called Raider Spirit, but man, ours was a hundred or I mean, it was 11 days, I think 10 and a half days, 11 days. But in that time frame, we covered 190 miles. Wow. In that time, you know, with like 80 pound rucks on and like, I think six hours of sleep for the entire 10 days Oof. of the time frame. Horrible, you know, and that was like just a thrash session. I just remember every single night, um, when the night came, like I was so scared of the night that came. Cause you're like looking through PBS 14s, one eyed the entire night through a green tube. No, like sleep depth can be an insane, like hallucinogenic kind of factor, you know, like yeah. dude, we were seeing all kinds of, uh, I remember just seeing these massive rats, like just chilling and looking at me, like as I'm walking past, like, I know you're not real, you know, right. <laughs> right. You know, kind of thing. And um, uh, one of the other nights I was the team leader for that mission and I was supposed to lead him into like set up for an ambush or whatever it is, you know, with blanks and all that stuff. But, uh, at one point I was like in front of the patrol trying to lead it and like trying to guide us. And I swear to God, I was, I thought I was in a four way intersection of a mall with a fountain in the middle. Like I was a hundred percent believe in it. I'm like, what the fuck is going on, dude? Wow. And I'm like asking people like, Hey, I don't know where to go right now, dude. Like there's a four way intersection. There's a fountain here. And like, everyone's like, what the dude, this guy's losing it. Um, and I remember like, all right, let's go around. And I feel like I'm walking around into an escalator and just riding an escalator up as I'm walking to the top of the hill at night and trying to figure that out, dude. But wow. Yeah. 
crazy, but um, my prime it was on my team for that um, for ITC as well, and we had one of our other buddies camp. But we made this hand and arm signal that went like this, and this was our signal because we had some field ops before that that we were developing, like and figuring out that this was going to be extremely horrible. That like as soon as we give this hand and arm signal, everybody in the team just starts losing their shit, like. <laughs> acting like they're hallucinating and, and like just doing all kinds of stuff so all my friends thought that i was trying to do that so they were giving me the hand and arm signal at night thinking that i was faking it and i just remember seeing people like this and i just seen all these weird images in their head like flipping around like no dude, i'm just really tripping out right now dude <laughs> this is not staged dude wow um but yeah so the last thing for that field op or that the Raider spirit was, I remember you have to do a time 12 mile ruck with all your shit on the two forties, you know, saws, all that stuff. And if you didn't make the timeline, you'd have to do a th another three mile hike through the swamp. Ooh. Oh dude. And that was, this was like the last event. So we literally like, they were giving us no watches, no anything, no GPS to anything, but they were like, you have, you know, two minutes to get to the finish line or whatever. And I just remembered, like the whole team with all our kit and was like sprinting and we all thought we made it and one of our buddies i'm not gonna drop his name but he was like 30 seconds behind so we didn't make oh. the timeline so you had to do the extra three miles we had to do three miles through swamp bro like like belly button deep swamp for the rest of it dude and i just remember getting back from raider spirit and taking off my boot and my left the bottom of my left foot like probably like a quarter inch thick of skin just falls off with my sock as I'm pulling it off, dude. Oh, like, like hamburger meat, huh? Dude, it's so bad. Because, <laughs> you know, North Carolina, dude, no matter what, dude, your feet are not staying dry. Yeah. You know, you know Lejeune, man. Mm -hmm. And it was like in the Verona Loop area. I don't know if you're not familiar with that. Yeah. Man, it's just horrible. But, wow. Yeah. So that was ITC. And then, of course, after that, went to like the shooting package, which is like the coolest shit ever, right? I never shot that many rounds from pistol from a 45. Um, and that much M4, right? Like coming from the infantry, like only squad leaders and above got M4s at the time. The rest of us had like muskets, you know, the, the M16, you know, A4s, Yeah. you know? So, um, yeah, that, that was awesome. The last thing was like the Derna Bridge kind of package, which is like the Robin Sage from the SF guys, where you do like a three long training environment of like going into you know, going through all the motions for that. Wow. So. Did, um, did a lot of people drop out of ITC? Yeah, man. So our class, I think we started with 106, and then we graduated with 16 of the original guys. Wow. But the graduating class was, I think, was like 24 or something like that. And, of course, we had guys pick up from other classes and stuff. From being recycled from in From being front recycled of and, and coming back in. Wow, 106 to 16. Yeah, dude, it was, it was insane. The pool and the water was one of the biggest portions. I remember... In the amphib pay, or phase, we went down to Key West because it was too cold in North Carolina to do all the stuff in the water. Um, and I literally had like four fin partners that dropped out on the fins, right? Every morning you wake up, you do a 2K fin. If you make the time, you're good. If you don't, you gotta do it again. If you don't make the time, you gotta do it again. And literally on one day, I did six kilometers of finning. <laughs> like, and I was the only one that did that because I had two partners dropped out. They threw another guy on me that was failing. I'm like, Dude, there's no way I can continue to do this. And you're not just doing 2K and then 2K back. You're doing 2K, get out of the water, run back to the start point, do it again. Wow. Get out of the water and do it again. And like you're running with that pack on, dude, like soaking wet. If you didn't waterproof it well, like it's the worst. So yeah. when you pass ITC, um, I imagine you go through a graduation and get pinned with the... We didn't have any device or anything oh. at the time, right? So uh, our... Um, it was Gunny Campbell at the time, like majorly look up to this guy who was our proctor for the entire class. So he led us through all the phases and stuff like that, made sure we were all okay. Old uh, Force Recon guy, um, I still look up to him today. And I live by one of his quotes he told us one time, but he got us all like the World War II patches made. And that was like our thing they gave out, even though that was against the command because everybody didn't want to be, you know, have a name and a title at the time. And it was like, kind of very anti-command or, you know, counterculture mm. for what it's supposed to be. So that was, like, so sick to get that. And I still have that patch, like, in my safety deposit box at home. Nice. You know, like, that's something I treasure 
incredibly. So what's that? Uh, what's the quote? Oh, it's uh, be humble, be hard, and always push the fight. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so you get through ITC, man. Talk to me about what your experience was like being in the unit after that. Yeah. So um, I check into the unit, and I remember the very first thing um, we check in, and uh, there was this guy named Master Sergeant Durbin. I think he got out as a Master Guns or something like that. He's like, all right, everybody bring it in. Come in. Because we first attached to this thing called the T-cell, which is a training cell where, uh, you know, guys are getting ready. You go to a few schools or whatever that is, and you'll chop off to your team, make sure the guys are qualified and stuff like that. But he's like, bring it in, bring it in. Old recon guy. And he's like, all right, who wants to go to, ju- who wants to, go to jump? And everybody's like, oh, I want to go to jump school. Who wants to go to dive? I was like, oh, I want to go to dive school. And he was like, listen, all these cool schools. And he was like, fuck no, none of you go to these fucking schools. So you prove to me that you can be an asset to the team. And I just remember like, bro, not again, dude. I thought I was going to go into a professional organization. But I was like, not again. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, I did some T-cell time um, before I chopped a team. And then um, did like, you know, some Intel courses and, you know, jump school and all that stuff. And then, um, cause it wasn't part of the pipeline then now it's part of the pipeline. You go to jump and dive and, and all that stuff. But, um, I originally chopped to Bravo company first to be a combat replacement for a team that was over there. But actually when I went through ITC, I didn't have my SEER school gone through yet. The rest of my class went to SEER school, but I didn't have my security clearance done at the time yet. So I had to sit back while I wait. So then, when I got to Bravo Company, like, what the fuck? You don't have SEER school done? So I lost my opportunity to go on probably one of the coolest missions. And in Afghanistan, the commando mission was like one of the coolest things. You live on a big base, you got a pool in Afghanistan, and all you do is go out and do direct action hits with the Afghan commandos. Wow. The rest of the teams on the company goes, goes out and does a VSP uh, mission or a VSO mission, which is village stability operations. Like you go in and develop a police force, you go fight with them. Uh, but that's a lot more boring than just flying in a, you know, um, into the target and you have an AC-130 on almost every single mission. Wow. You know, so that's like the ultimate thing. So I missed out on that. So I went to search school and then I came back. And then by that time, um, Alpha Company needed some guys. So I chopped over to Alpha Company um, when I got to the team. But the first day I checked into the team, one of the guys I went to selection with, um, he uh, was some good friends of mine too. He was a, but he was like, Oh, good thing Tran's on the team or Don's on the team. We need an Asian guy to go to communication school. So they sent me to be the comm guy in school, went back to North Carolina for four months just to learn networks, radios, all that stuff from the Marsoc side kind of thing. So that was the second time I got shafted with jobs (laughs) because I'm Asian. Uh, But no, it was a great learning experience. And dude, being the comm guy on the team was like a huge asset because no matter what, you need communications, right? You need to get clearance for fires. You need to communicate with people. So like it was a job that I took very seriously. And, um, we went to Afghanistan with, when I was a combat for the team and, um, uh, we were in, um, this VSP site called Puse and then, um, probably like 20 clicks away from Sangin. And then we went into Fabra, which is right across the street from the Sangin after that. But did that mission compared to, or that deployment compared to my infantry deployments was like, night and day of like how much support you can actually have, um, how we do targeting on, you know, on the bad guys. I think that deployment, like we took out 11 HVIs off the battlefield for that. So it was like precision, right? Like we're not going out there just to get shot at. We're going in there to get the bad guy, remove this guy because this guy was a financier for the Taliban. He was an ID maker or whatever that is that removed strategic people from the battlefield that made it safer for the environment instead of like, Hey, let's go out and go on patrol and get shot at so we can shoot back, mm. you know? So like, that was like, holy shit, I'm in the right place. Like, this is what I want to do. And that deployment, like, and I we had a, probably my best team still to this day, um, with great leadership, like great support guys and, and all that stuff. Like the, I, the EOD guys, like, you know, human Intel and all that stuff, dude, they're still my great friends to this day. Cause we had such a successful, deployment on that. So the deployment before us, or the team that before us, they had a major insider attack that they had some of their Afghan um, special forces guys turn their backs on them and, and shoot three of our guys in the COC. Oh. Um, Matt Manukin, Sky Mode, and Ryan Jeske, EOD team commander and uh, just a team guy on there. So like when we got on the ground, it was like, we're fucking finding everybody that was involved. We're 
going to take him out from that battlefield. And I remember us finding the guy and taking him out through a very like creative way. And I was, that was like, and we got him and he had IDs in his car and he blasted out through the car, like 30 feet, you know, like in front of him. And we were just like, we, like we couldn't tell and wait to tell the news to his family and all their families and all that stuff. So that was like a, a super powerful moment. Cause I just remembered those guys coming back cause we were still in our workup, you know, and like they were coming, like their bodies were coming back and the memorials and ceremonies for them was there. So it was like super like a fucking America moment for them. So yeah, yeah wow. it's powerful. Any other stories from Afghanistan that stand out to you? I think we we're at Fab Rob already at this time, um, which is like on a big plateau. And there's like, we, we were regarded by um, some, not locals, but like a security company that was not Afghan, but not US kind of things around. I think there maybe would have been like seven or eight towers around it, big LZ in the back of Fab Rob. It was like a, a very established base, you know, um, and we were moving there because we, turn, we turned over Puse to um, the Afghan local police there and they were running operations and stuff out of there. But one day we had a helicopter, a Huey, a Marine, um, aircraft take off. I think it was drop someone off and picking somebody up or whatever is and flying out. And it uh, ended up crashing like 300 meters outside of Fab Rob. Ooh. So like at two in the morning, we'd usually fly at night because you know, the contact and stuff like that. But, um, drive out there in ATVs, pick these guys up, bring them back in and we're like, all right, cool. Let's worry about the helicopter in the morning because there was hellfires in there, you know, um, so like munitions, there's comms and communication stuff out there. And it, that area is like the hot spot of like where we would just get random gunfights in all the time, like from the towers and shooting down there, shoot at us, we shoot back. You know, it never really like came to a point where we needed to ever cross it because of course ID filled and all that stuff. But the helicopter was very close to that line. So we're like, okay, all right, cool. Let's figure out a plan um, on how to do this. So we stood security, stood up the whole base, and like, all right, let's start getting ready to get this thing back. But it ended up being like a, a three-day firefight or like 29 hours or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but to get this helicopter back in um, and to do that. And I just remember there was so much fight, so much gunfire, and there's like this place called the Glass House across the street that no matter what, dude, there would be such accurate fire coming out of there. I don't know how they set it up in the back, but they can just shoot through something like that. And um, we had one of our man tech guys, which is like our uh, like mechanic guys, civilian side, that was just contracting when they get shot over there. And it was just like a, oh, wow. a situation. And we had to fly in a platoon from 2-1 to come support us and try to get that helicopter back, right? Because the command was like, we need the comms, we need the crypto, we need all that stuff. We need to come back and bring it back in. But that was like probably one of the, the coolest fights. And I had some buddies come out from the commando team to support us. And one of my good buddies, uh, Mike, that I've like, we went through ITC together, comm school, jump school, all that stuff together. We were just looking for that final opportunity to actually get in a gunfight together because he was on a, the commando team, came out, supported us. And that was like the, one of the sickest moments that building up to like training and all that stuff and actually getting to fight with one of your homies that you did all the training with was wow. like one of the highlights of that deployment for me. Yeah, that's awesome, man. You yeah. guys went through the suck together yeah. and now you're there. And like, just like trying to prove ourselves the entire time and you're actually over there doing like the job. And, wow. Yeah. Was, that's, that's, that right there is what really builds that camaraderie yeah, you know, that the Marine Corps sure. has. Huh? Like, yeah. That's awesome. I got the chills, man. You tell yeah. me that. <laughs> oh, good, dude. Yeah, so uh, after my Afghan deployment, um, I think Obama was pulling a, a big majority of the troops out of the Middle East. So um, with 1st Marine Raider Battalion, we were assigned to the Pacific. So to head out there in, like, you know, Phil Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, how about the piracy operations, counterterrorism, and all that stuff. Um, and, of course, you know, get information on neighboring countries uh, within those areas. And... Um, our first deployment after that, after Afghanistan, was to um, the Philippines and just training up their Marine forces there um, and working with them to get the dive missions and amphib missions and stuff like that. So getting ready for the water again. But my last deployment or last real deployment was um, with MARSOC was back to the Philippines. And it was our mission to go this time instead of training them to go down and um, help the piracy operations in Mindanao. So that's the southern the biggest, the southern biggest 
island of the Philippines and all like the 7,000 islands they have or whatever it is, but crazy big um, Muslim population there and a lot of piracy operations happen there from like kidnap for ransom to uh, drugs to um, straight terrorism funded by, you know, whatever organizations all around the world and stuff like that. So um, originally we went down there to, and this was like in 2017 to help out and train those guys first and figure out like where we really belong. Cause it wasn't a big, massive U S forced there for a long time and we were on the uh this city called Zamboanga on like the southwestern end it was like the wild wild west of um um the Philippines and you know we never wore uniforms except for when we were on base dealing with our own superiors and commanders because they didn't really want to know that there were Americans there so drove around in high luxes you know concealed carry the whole time um and all that stuff so that was a really cool experience coming from Afghanistan where like you're in full contact kind of environment to like, Hey, a more, um, mellowed out, but Hey, the threat's still there kind of, uh, situation. So, um, I think in May of 2017, there was a city in the center of Mindanao that was called Marawi that was taken over by ISIS. So, um, I think we've been in country for maybe two months at the time. So we were tasked, my team specifically was tasked to augmenting and helping, uh, advise and assist the, the Filipino military to take the city back. Um, so we came in there and I was a JTAC at the time, which is a joint terminal attack controller. Um, so I got to control air assets and stuff like that. So I was one of the guys that went in, I was the operations chief for the, or the team at the time. So I took like six guys with me and we embedded within the Filipino military and was like running operations out of like a hilltop kind of thing. But that was like a super cool environment and a few months before or the few weeks before that I was up in the embassy in Manila training some of the JTACs over there um and living like in a five-star hotel you know up there in the in Makati and then like a few weeks later I'm down in like the jungles living it on a hammock and fighting these ISIS guys down there so wow. that was like a very cool deployment to kind of cap everything off and, and finish it off with so um was it like a lot of intel gathering so a lot of flew ISRs off of like uh, carrier groups uh, in the Pacific. So they would fly over support with that. Um, and the drones war kind of really became a thing then because all the bad guys were flying drones over to collect on us. So like we had to figure out like, hey, how do we drop these drones out of the sky? So at first, you know, we're like shooting at these things and hitting a drone, a moving drone with a weapon is extremely hard. I don't care what you should, maybe with a shotgun or something mm -hmm. when it gets close enough, but they never fly that close. So we ended up hitting up DJI getting like a, a frequency that drowned out everything. So we started dropping these drones out of the sky, picked, recovered them up, found the SD cards, threw them in our laptops, traced them back to where they were, and then call for fire or call airstrikes on them, you know? Wow. So it was, it was pretty cool. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of intel collection, but we only sh shot at, we sh only shot back when we got shot at. That was like the clear rules of engagement. So. Um, everybody tries to get the advise assist in a company mission. So we didn't get the company mission where we were there, like the triple A mission, like they did beginning early days of Afghanistan or, you know, in Iraq after that and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, we just had that advise and assist mission. So we, we did get shot at a lot. Um, and we did, you know, return fire when it was appropriate because my captain got shot, um, on that deployment there in his ass. Um, and yeah, it was just a really cool environment of like, plain clothes, doing something like that special operations is meant to do, mm. not just kick down doors and, you know, yeah. um, and all that stuff. When so. you guys were getting shot at, were you out like on convoys or what, what were you doing? Uh, majority of it. Right. So, um, in the middle of the city or there was like, um, on the Southwest side, there was like this massive hill that they had a military base there already. So that would became like the headquarters of the hub and stuff like that. And, you know, thousands of troops were on this hill pretty much. So built sandbags and stuff like that. But, you know, after three months of living on a hill with no running water and stuff like that, it gets pretty grimy on human waste and all that stuff. So we had to fill a bunch of sandbags with whatever dirt there was because we kept getting shot at um, uh, on top of the hill. And when they cleared a specific certain area of the, the city already, then they became a little bit more safe. But um, before that, it was like, all kinds of rounds being shot at us from five, five, six to, I don't know if it was the Filipinos or whatever in the chaos or whatever that is, yeah. you know? Um, wow. 
kind of thing. So. Um, be, being uh, in the Philippines, um, did you ever get downtime? Were you ever able to go out on Libo or anything during that deployment? Um, when in Manila, when I was working at the embassy, yeah, the, you know that was like insane, good yeah. good times. But, yeah. um, and down in Zamboanga, which is like the where the major of our special operations task force was assigned before we go out to these other areas around Mindanao. There, there was a semi kind of, you know, libo or libo time there. And of course we used the, hey, we've got to go out and collect information. We got to go to meetings here. We got to go talk to that commander. We got to go do all that stuff. So it was kind of okay for the operators to go out, but the rest of the base didn't really get that mm. opportunity to go out. But we're like, hey, we got, mich- we got meetings every day. We got to go meet with the Intel guys. We got to meet with the air officers and all that stuff. So we really use any excuse to, go out, you know, go drinking with them and meeting them and, and all that stuff and, and kind of building that relationship. So, and I think in October or something during that time frame as well, I was like, man, we're really getting, I'm getting close to getting out. I started talking to Prime more of because he wasn't on my same team. He was always the company that was deployed before me. So we're like, hey, we should explore doing, you know, some businesses and doing something together um, where, cause we, he just gotten out like in August of that year and I got, I'm, I was getting out very soon. We're like, yeah, let's explore something. So put our heads together and, uh, we had like a, a sheet of like, Hey, we can do some security contract and his family's from Corpus Christi down in Texas. So I wanted to explore some, he has a lot of connections down in like Monterey and Mexico and do some security guys stuff with those guys. But it ended up being too hairy of a situation of two guys, you know, thought that we knew everything going down and doing security in Mexico. Yeah. for you know for whoever for whoever it was you know and it was like kind of like a weird blurry gray area we're like all right let's maybe let's not do that so then <laughs> explored um starting what we have now which is deep in fitness and the underwater torpedo league um with time because yeah. back when we were working at the pool you know the way that we were building the most confidence is we were playing a, a game called underwater football at the time you know it's just torpedo toy torpedo put kettlebells down at the 15 foot deep pool and then like whoever can hang on swim with the torpedo hang on to the kettlebell for the longest wins or whatever it is. So we would be thrashing each other um, there. And then we had like a old jailhouse weight set at the pool that, you know, we worked out in and jumped in the pool. And then the hills of Camp Pendleton where SOI was like from Horno to SOI is like the alpha shelf um, in that area. So a lot of hills and stuff like that. So um, we're like, Hey, we love being in the water. We love coaching and teaching people. Let's start a business exploring doing that. So at the end of that year, we had two pools locked on even before I got out of the military. So we had the pool in San Clemente and Oceanside um, at the time. And one of our buddies, uh, Derek Carrera, he was um, on the same team as Prime, got shot uh, in the spine on their, his first deployment to Afghanistan, paralyzed from the chest down. But um, he was like, hey, if you can get two pools, you can get people to sign up and pay and attend these sessions or these games or whatever it is, you have a business idea. So we ran like a little competition in January of 2018. Um, and we're like, all right, cool. We got a shit ton of people that want to do this. And it was a lot of recon guys. It was a lot of infantry guys from base because it was at San Clemente and, and Oceanside. And it was like two groups of Marines just duking it out in the pool, <laughs> you know? Um, and then from there, it kind of grew into um, additional pools that we were trying to run on our own on that side of the company while I was going to school. Uh, and then uh, I think at the time I was just transferring into Chapman University, which is like a little private school in Orange. Um, and then continued to build the business, go to school, and then went over to um, USC and did a master's program there and then still building the business. And now we're five and a half years into the business and, and building that. So. Nice. And this is the Deep End Fitness? Yeah, this is Deep End Fitness, uh, majority of it, and then a little bit of the Underwater Torpedo League. Yeah, because yeah. that so that the underwater torpedo league stemmed off of Deep End Fitness. We actually started the company was originally called Underwater Football mm. League at the time, and we were like, we had no idea what we we're doing, you know, like because yeah. that's what we called it in the military. Thinking like in 2018, like we, we we were lucky enough to start training these NFL players in the off season and a bunch of MMA fighters, and they're like, dude, we love what you guys are doing. This is extremely beneficial, but I can't call it underwater football if I'm on a football team, you know, like this is we need to create a new name for this. So we were like, oh, well, we're training in the deep end of the pool. So that's when we started Deep End Fitness. And then 
there was a lot of non-correlation with football and the torpedo that we had yeah. as well. And people were like, what are you doing? Like, how's this football? So we're like, that makes sense. We just always called it that way. So then we rebranded it Underwater Torpedo League. Nice, yeah. nice. And how are you guys doing with it right now? Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're doing good. Like after COVID, man, that really kicked our ass of like, cause I think up into code, we had seven pools at the time and we were running and operating all of our own. So I was like managing sessions in LA, Orange County, and Prime was like, you know, North County, San Diego kind of thing, and kind of split those territory. And we we're doing everything ourselves. But um, after COVID, we're like, dude, there's no way we can manage all these locations on our own anymore. So we launched our expansion program through like a licensing um, program where they pay an annual fee and then they take our brand, our um, programs and our methodology, and then they start their own business and, and run with that. So now, it's been a good uh, acceleration and a lot of momentum moving forward with, um, I think we're uh, hitting our 21st location in Carlsbad nice. uh, this weekend. And then, um, yeah, and then a lot of higher profile athletes are coming train with us. We have a small contract with the Padres down in San Diego, a small one with the Chargers up in LA. So um, continue to build this and train a lot of first responders, police force, and then figuring out if there's a way back into the military and, and taking all the things that we've learned in the business and our training modalities, right? Cause this is something we do every single day for the last five and a half years. Right. And like the military guys, even though they are divers or, you know, water spot instructors, they're probably doing it a few times a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've just learned so much and we just want to share that back of how we can benefit people and, um, in the community. So, nice. Yeah. And if somebody wants to get involved in uh, underwater torpedo league, what, what, how do they go about that? Yeah. So the league is uh, right now. It's like an open tournament kind of thing. So this we're gonna run our second tournament in uh, September thirtieth um, and October first. So it's open invite. You can join. There's two leagues: a rookie league and then a pro league. The pro leagues like if you have some experience with everybody, but and you can join a team. Last season we had. Uh, a team come up from MCRD, like nothing but drill instructors, and uh, they ended up winning the rookie league. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, I mean, they play, I don't know if people know this, but they play underwater torpedo like every Tuesdays and Thursdays or something down at their pool down there before they thrash all the recruits. Oh, you know? really? So, like, they were like, came in, and I was like, man, these guys are really good, and they ended up winning the rookie league. And then the pro league, it's a, a team from Newport, um, but we had teams from Texas come in, I think we got Portland coming in vegas coming in this upcoming one so nice. that's the underwater torpedo league. and then for deep and fitness we have 21 locations now uh, just check us out at deepandfitness.com and find a location near you we got some online programs um, that if you want to do it at home as well awesome did you ever experience uh you know any type of anxiety depression ptsd from being in combat or just from being in the environment you know the fast-paced environment that you were used to in the marine corps a lot of it and uh not just when I got out of the military too, like after that Afghan deployment, um, I got back and I just remembered with one of my ex-girlfriends, I was in the mall with her and um, I, I think it was like a week or something back, right? And I, I just started having this like panic attack, this anxiety. I'm like, dude, what's going on? There's just so much people in the mall that day. I think it was like a hot summer day or something like that. And I'm like, everybody's going there for AC. I'm like freaking out. I'm like, I start shaking. I'm like, I had to, I had to pretend like I had a phone call so I can get out of the mall because I didn't want to tell her that I was like freaking out, you know? Um, other things like to, to kind of, because in the military they teach you to compartmentalize really well and like an emotion or a fear, whatever that is, like might not come out until you're intoxicated or whatever this. So like I was having a few like extreme blackout incidents, incidences where I was like reliving like scenarios in my life or whatever that was and one of them was uh, I was in Vegas for my friend's bachelor party and I blacked out and um, I tried to flip the roulette table but of course it's it's bolted down right so then they arrested me and and all that stuff and on the way out like I kicked like a trash can into like a brand new seven series beamer and all kinds of thing I tried to punch the security guard I broke my hand and like when I came to I was like handcuffed like kneeling up on the wall and thank God it was a like a retired SEAL that was like the security of like Palazzo or something like that. But I never actually even told my commander anything about this. But, you know, I was like freaking out and I, I didn't even know what happened. And those episodes were half, happening a lot to me. And lucky my team commander like called and got me out of that situation and all that stuff. Said he was going to reprimand me and all that stuff. But just like 
not being able to communicate like the trauma that I seen from birth, like back in Iraq, never even talked about that to had a friend die in Afghanistan as well, you know, Mike Guillory, like, and just like so many things that the MARSOC or actually the military community is like, Hey, you know, suck it up, continue on with the process, suck it up. You have a mission to continue on to. So that was even my mindset going in from, um, you know, the military to next mission. All right, let's start a company. Let's, you know, let's go to school. And like, it was always like a go, go, go kind of mentality for me to never actually digest and deal with all that shit. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is so heavy, dude, about like the things you went to and, and it could be a, um, a small thing, but you not dealing with that or talking to somebody about it or, or getting some help or whatever that is can compile on and just fuck you so hard, dude. And like, um, I got, I got out with disability, like 80% of it. And like, literally it was all from the mental aspect side. Cause all my shit was like, I had to go see counselors all the time when I was in the military, you know, like I'm stressed out. Like I don't want to see anybody, but like people can tell, or like my command can tell, like, you know, that something was extremely bothering me. And then these incidents happening with like blacking out and shit like that and, and all that stuff. So it was like, dude, if I can say anything, it's like, it's okay to, to talk about it. Cause when I started talking about it, you know, with like the first girl I ever told any of like these stories to is like my girlfriend right now, which she's amazing. I love her. Um, and she's awesome. Blanca. Um, but like, that was like the first step of my opening up to myself mm. just because I told someone that I really truly cared about. Right. And like, like I would never even think about it. I'm like, Oh, I'm thinking about this. Oh, this is not worth it. My time. You know, I got other shit to do all the time. And, like actually opening up about it, like allowed a space that understood for me that it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to have these like thoughts about yourself or whatever it is to, to move forward. So I encourage everybody to do that. Yeah. Is there anything that you do now to um, combat that mental stress of everything you've experienced? Um, I know you're uh, big into physical activity, you know, yes, with the deep yeah. end fitness, and uh, you're getting ready to go to these CrossFit games. Is that something you utilize for your mental health as well? Yeah, it is, man. And like being physically fit and like, or going through physical struggle, I would say more like it is uh, definitely a medicine for me, right? Because it makes you present in the moment, it forgets to like, hey, you're here focusing on bettering yourself whether that be like getting stronger, faster, whatever you are into, like that's up to you. But for me, like that, the training in the water aspect is such a huge component for me as well. Cause you know, when you go underwater, there's certain stressors that happen in your own mind, right? Like, Hey, can I come, do I need to come up for air right now? Do I understand my body is enough? Or like, Hey, do I have all these doubts that I can't do something? But at the end of the day, like most people could hold their breath for like three minutes. You know, they, most people could do a significant amount of work underwater um, without even training for it, but like going through that struggle and that facing that like small bit of fear every single time for me, it's like, oh, it makes me feel alive. And it also like helps me like, hey, when I'm dealing with stress outside as well, like, hey, I've been here at this stressing point at so many times, I can better cope with it and better deal with it. But um, having a support network as well as like with because like when we got out, um, Prime and I, like we, we started deep in fitness. So we started building community already, like right away. And it was like a bunch of military guys to start off with, but now it's like so much different people of like, you know, swimmers, athletes, you know, parents, and just like a, a massive community where you could talk to people about it. And everybody's going through that same fear underwater at some point in that workout where it's like, it creates so much open space for people to connect and, and do all that stuff. So community aspect has really helped out um, in that aspect. And I still talk to a lot of my Raider buddies. A lot of them got out the same time as I did as well and transitioning to other things in their careers. Um, and then uh, I was fortunate enough to have like some plant-based medicine that helped me overcome like a major hump uh, in that process um, as well. So nice. Well, Don, we're getting ready to wrap it up. Um, cool. any, any last words? Yeah. If uh, you guys ever need anything, reach out to me on Instagram or on our, you know, Facebook page or whatever that is. And we love to help out and guys getting ready for the military or, you know, guys transitioning out. We started that nonprofit, um, operation resilience a few months ago and it's just to really help, 
um, veterans and or active duty military guys and athletes transition from where they're at to where they need to be, right? And we're not an expert in anything, but just providing resources, of vetted resources from that we've done ourselves or that we have uh, uh, talked to and we know it's a good source for you. Whether you wanna go on a venture, you know, like find purpose, education, or, you know, find healing, dude, we're, we're here for it all. So reach out to us. Where could people find you on uh, Instagram or social media? Uh, yeah, it's on Instagram, it's uh, don.lives. Um, and then our Deep End Fitness page is just Deep End Fitness, Operation Resilience, just Operation underscore Resilience. Uh, the Underwater Torpedo League is just Underwater Torpedo League. So, I mean, many ways on Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, and all that stuff. So Awesome. Well, hey, Don, I appreciate you coming to take the seat, brother. It's a big yeah. contribution to Urban Valor. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears Who gon' save me if you not right here Move this darkness and make my sight clear Take me away cause I don't like here Ghost of my past, they feelin' the night air Wake me up, I'm trapped in my nightmares